And I thought I would say about the handouts that the department uh, is uh, considering pay for it. I mean, that's charged for them. They only do about 100 copies. So I, I think that's enough of you who are taking the class. For those of you who are auditing me, of course, you are welcome to it, but I wish you would wait until everyone else has picked up on it. Or what alternatively you might do is make some arrangement for those who are taking the class and then you could wear off the copies. Then we have enough for everybody who is taking the class. Okay, I think that's not amazing. Okay, well our plans are today, I'll go on saying some more things about the two principles of justice, and there's, and there's a handout up here on that. There's also a handout on lock as well. Um, pick those up afterward. Um, so I will really continue where I left off the other day, and I find that I can only say rather few things. I can't cover everything as I have said before. Um, you will have to go over the sections that I don't say anything about and try to make it fit together to some extent, as I hope uh, perhaps eventually will. What I'll begin by doing is saying some things about uh, the meaning of the difference principle and explaining some, some points about it and say some things about some possible objections. And then after having done that, I want to introduce some things about the notion of dessert and some problems and misunderstandings that I think arise in regard to it. And with all of these things, I'm, I'm not uh, taking offense or anything of other people. I'm just trying to use these objections and these difficulties to explain uh, what's been said, really. And I think the point of going through it you like this, it isn't that I, of course, expect you to find it plausible in the end, but I think it brings out some of the problems involved in trying to develop any kind of view at all. And so in that way, I hope that, that you might find it instructive. So as I say, I'll begin with a few points about the difference principle that tend to raise difficulties. Now, keep in mind throughout that it is subordinate to the first principle of justice, 
and it's also subordinate to the principle of fair equality of opportunities. So in this conception of uh, a word society that we introduced earlier, the difference principle is to be applied within a background framework of institutions, the basic structure, that already satisfies those two principles. So we take that for granted, although we don't mention it all the time. So if you have a society where those principles are not satisfied, then you can't apply the principle in a straightforward way. Maybe it tells you something important, but it isn't just that you can apply it because the background framework doesn't hold for it. So to that extent, we are dealing with a somewhat ideal notion, and I mentioned earlier that the point of doing that is if we want to get certain things clear, certain relatively basic points are clear in order to try to reach some understanding of the proper balance of the claims of liberty and equality. That's sort of always a factor in the problem. So we have to understand it's, it's, it is subordinate and is to be applied in the context of where these other principles are satisfied. I'm going to leave to TJ to pages 66 and 71 to explain what the principle of Pareto efficiency is. Um, I think that explanation there is reasonably clear. I think perhaps in a class of this size uh, it would be best to go to sections anyway. So I would assume that that's uh, more or less understood. And if you, of course, have had any economics at all, have already uh, familiar with that from um, very early on in your, in your book. Now, as we talked about the last time, I went over that the principle of efficiency and the other principles of justice and the way in, in which they're ranked always apply to the institutional structure regarded as a public system of rules. And we're always assuming that throughout. Now, a point that is not clearly enough mentioned in the text is that the system of cooperation that we're dealing with is always assumed to be productive. That is, we're always assuming people are engaged in social cooperation and they are uh, producing things in and through their cooperation and that the distribution that takes a place is a, the distribution of things that they produce together and in accordance with the claims that they acquire, which are called uh, entitlements, which based on the general expectations, etc. All that is part of the scheme, and it is uh, productive. So be careful to note that in the figures, the two figures on page 68 and 7, where the explanation of the principle of efficiency is being given, that those figures assume that there is no production. We just have a fixed bundle of goods that uh, we can give all to person X1, all of them person X2, or we can divide them up in some way. And if we do that efficiently, why do they help me get that smooth curve by hypothesis? If we make these uh, nice assumptions. If it's actually divided up in some way, it was indivisible, why then there would be a number of points. But we make all the nice assumptions that we can divide it up. Uh, so we get it smooth. But the important thing there is just we're assuming a fixed bundle. It isn't being produced by anybody. There's no cooperative relations. So that's really a case of allocated justice, as we talked about the last time. On the figures on page, uh, I think it's 76 and, and 7, where they're <coughs> assuming that in drawing the OP curve that we have a productive scheme of book cooperation. And, and I don't think, and as I say in the text, I don't think that really very fundamental contrast is made clear enough um, as it should be. 
So that in the figure, say, on page 76 to 77, the idea is that without cooperation, there isn't anything produced at all, and so nothing to distribute. And that situation with that production would be even represented by the origin, point zero, where the y-axis and the x-axis cross. Now, but given a definite scheme of cooperation of some sort, then the returns to the two groups can be varied with the results indicated by the OP curve. The letter P is supposed to help you remember that it's we're concerned with the production. It's how production is affected by the variation of returns to the two groups, given a, a scheme of a cooperation. So it is assumed then that the greater returns that go to the more advantage, that is those who are represented on the x-axis, that those greater, greater of returns will then cover the cost of <coughs> training that they indicate and mark out positions of responsibility and, and encourage people to act responsibly, that they are incentives, innovation, all variety of other things, rather complicated social, sociological, psychological story that uh, we don't have to go or even know very much about the details of. We just assume that there is some such explanation as to why uh, the scheme is more productive in those cases. Now, a particular OP curve indicates the returns from a particular scheme of cooperation as determined by how its public rules say organize a cooperation, how it uh, arranges a division of labor and things of that sort, how it organizes the positions of responsibility, so, and how it assigns various uh, roles to those engaged in it. So we're taking for granted any time we draw a particular curve that we're, we're concerned with some particular scheme of a cooperation. And what <coughs> we are doing is to vary only one aspect of it. We're varying, in some sense, uh, the returns measured in, for simplicity at the moment, primary goods of income and wealth, uh, to those who are engaged in it. So that's what we're doing. Uh, in order to explain how that is, is, is to be taken. So, um, wh what we say is then that any point on the OP curve uh, the returns, if the returns to the more advantage are represented on the x-axis, then the return to the less advantage indicated by the corresponding point on the y-axis. So to some extent, we're considering uh, the returns to the more advantage, if you like, as the independent variable, although we don't have to go into that for the particular matter for our purposes. But that's the thing we're varying. And then I come to the really essential <coughs> point about which one is not stated in the text and it ought to be, namely that the presumption is that when we apply the difference principle, we have found out at the moment what we think is, is the highest OP curve, or what we suppose of a world-ordered society, it has found, if not the highest, how can you always optimize anyway? That's kind of ideal. But let's say it has a high or reasonably efficient OP curve, and that <coughs> means that the other aspects of the cooperation are organized effectively. The term I use on, on, on the sheet is effective. So the presumption is that we're always dealing with a highly effective or reasonably effective scheme of a cooperation. Otherwise, we would not uh, be interested in the curve. Or, in one might say, would be better to say, in the scheme of a cooperation, that, that particular OP curve is drawn for. If it's a very inefficient scheme of a cooperation, why then we forget about it, then the non-instant OP curve, because we know it'll be very flat with investment. 
So, the point is that we want to find reasonably effective organization cooperation in the first book in applying the difference principle. And one could say roughly other things equal to indicate the thing I have in mind, that the time curve, is that one scheme of cooperation would be more effective than another if given any point on the x-axis, its corresponding O P curve is higher. Okay, maybe I was just a picture. Is this a very pleasant one? Yes, I'm asking too. Well, uh, the idea is this, is that we go up like this, and if we go like that, we draw it the simplest way, just one curve under the other, that's all. Okay. So what I said was that one OP curve is more effective a better design than another, other things equal. If we take any point for the more advantage, this OP curve is higher. So the, the, this curve here is more effectively designed than this scheme of chewing myself up here. Uh, say this represents the alpha scheme and this beta scheme, or whatever it is, then alpha is more effectively designed. So the idea is that we're supposed to operate or apply the, uh, the difference principle on the more effective, the better designed scheme of cooperation. Other things equal would we go up. Okay, that's it. Now I won't go into the complication of what happens if if we get this. Uh, the time being, we assume an only nice thing happens. Uh, just trying to get the, the very basic ideas. Um, economists are always are doing this. I don't see why other people can't do it. <laughs> Now, consider two objections. One objection is, now I'm now thinking a moral objection, uh, in the sense that we don't, when we think about this, it doesn't seem as if really um, we're going to be able to go along with it. It seems to conflict in some way with, I say, our everyday uh, judgment and moral judgments about justice. Um, one objection is the following. Suppose that the most effective OP curve rises real slowly like this. And we don't get to its maximum, say, until out here, where it begins to go down, perhaps. But by the time we get there, the ratio of returns to the more advantage over the less advantage is a large number. Perhaps the more advantage had uh, just to have a number of thousands to one, something like that. I mean, I say, well, that's too much. We don't have an exact idea how much, but there's something wrong with that. That's really too much. Uh, the other objection is, to take another curve, we'll, we'll, we'll draw another figure, uh, it might be fairly effectively organized up to the maximum point, but then it tapers off real slowly, uh, just like incline. So over here we found that if we pick the maximum, we had the ratio greatly favoring the more advantage, over here we find that if you pick the maximum, there's a very small loss that, we, that one might impose on the less advantage in return for a very large gain, let's say, to uh, the more advantage. Did I say that right? A very small loss to the less advantage 
prevents us from allowing the more advanced to have a very large gain. So in the one case, we are worried about the greater ratio of income and wealth of more advantage of the less. In the other case, we are concerned by uh, the fact that we can't go beyond the maximum because that is something we can't do, but it prevents us from a very large gain to the more advantage. Now, what do we say about this? Well, um, I'm not going to give any argument, anything that you particularly, I suppose, find plausible, something to think about, and that's something I don't really know beyond certain intuitive conjectures. But the idea is this. Um, this is the first case, say, that I'll discuss. In the first case, the problem is that earlier on, the scheme, this scheme of a proper Ethiopia curve rises very slowly. Now, why does that happen? Well, it might happen because there are very few people trained ability, and there are large uh, numbers of, of the less advanced perhaps. Um, perhaps very few people are educated or something of that sort. Perhaps uh, there are things about the society and so forth and so on that makes the uh, productive cooperation hard to do and, and the like. But in the case of this principle, uh, remember it's applied against a certain background uh, that includes their equality of opportunity. So it means that one has in mind a society in which people have a chance to educate their, their natural endowments. So you don't have the case of there being a few educated people. The presumption is that education would be, in general, available. And also, you will not have a cartel of some sort or some association that keeps down the competition of others who might enter into certain skills. You don't have that. So presumably, there'll be a fairly good supply of skills and talents and support and so on so that you ought to be able to organize a fairly efficient scheme of a cooperation you ought to have uh, an OP curve that rises reasonably quickly. Uh, in other words, I'm going in terms of what's in the background. The fact that we're applying this to a certain background means that the curve itself is not my and how to the case. So that roughly is going to be the kind of answer uh, to give to both, well, to the first one. The kind of answer to give to the second one is that surely there must be some way, some social device with taxation or otherwise, to transfer part of this very great gain of more advantage over on the other side. There'd be some way to do that, either by taxation or whatever, over on, on the other side. There should be some device uh, to tax what is it beyond the maximum. So it's to make some kind of a transfer. Uh, so what one is saying then is that one is applying this principle within a certain kind of social world a kind within which democratic institutions are possible and established, and they satisfy the prior principles. And it should be, as I say, this is a conjecture, a matter of ingenuity, defined devices, so these ratios, either way, either first case or the second case, will not strike us as unjust. Now that's a conjecture, it's not an argument, it's just uh, what the time being is being assumed. You might find it extremely implausible, or if not implausible, hard, hard to verify, and I would agree with that, that it would be hard to verify. It's hard to verify what is implied by and required by 
probably any general moral principle. So this isn't a peculiarity of this particular view. Now, now note that this ratio here is an observable feature of the distribution. That is, it's a matter, it might be hard to estimate because it isn't just a matter of the dollars and cents. Um, it involves some measure of income and wealth and so on. But even so, it's something that we could, or a statistician or economist might find out by looking at the distribution of upholding within a society. What's happening and what's the actual pattern of income? Now, the point I want to make is this, is that in this view, there is no limits, no specific limits imposed at all, no specific pattern imposed on what the distribution should be. That is, someone might say, well, it ought not to be greater than 50 to 1 in the first case. But we don't say anything like that on the grounds that I don't think that we could reach any agreement on what the limits are in either case. Uh, it's not feasible. So the idea is to set up a principle <coughs> that imposes a no limits at all, uh, to use adjusted, pure procedural justice, and then whatever it turns out to be, it ought to be within some range or other <coughs> such that it does not seem unjust to us. That is, it will not have various sorts of consequences, it will not seem to be unjust, provided, of course, uh, one is assuming that these returns have been earned within institutions that satisfy all these conditions. Now, the argument for that is the important thing isn't just the ratios, it isn't just the amounts, it's, it's how they're earned, and the nature of the functional contributions that are being made. So if you believe that the scheme is fair and entitlements are acquired in the light of pure procedure in this sense and one where it is adjusted, right, then the view is that that is the important thing and not exactly what the ratios are as a fall out of it of the actual amounts. Now again, um, you might not agree with that understanding, but that's the approach which has been taken. <coughs> there is one sense in which one might say that the difference principle does impose a pattern, or that it's egalitarian. Like there are a number of senses in which one might say it's egalitarian. One sense which I thought I would point out to you is this, that if we take, uh, suppose this is the highest effective OP curve, then it will select the, the maximum here. Suppose that this is the 45 degree line, <coughs> then, well, suppose it becomes vertical here, then this here to here is a kind of credo frontier, efficiency frontier, might be had in one of the figures of pages 66, is it, in the earlier section. It takes the, uh, the boundary of that frontier, and the boundary is closest to equality. It's the closest point on the frontier to equality. Um, so it's giving some kind, it's a kind of focal point where we're, we're making allowance both for efficiency because we're on the frontier and equality because it's the closest point to the 45 degree line. Um, so
So that's a kind of compromise, if you like. Obviously not the only compromise, but it's a kind of compromise, and it does have that feature. Well, now, I know there are a lot of questions about this, but is it making um, it kind of clear at the moment? Yes. <coughs> On the last example? <laughs> yeah, you mean up here? Uh, uh, what I said was, or what I meant was, that this is the max here on the OP curve. And it's also the boundary point in the sense of, of the interval. Uh, that goes up from here to where it becomes vertical. So we're so there would be two boundary points, and it's this boundary point, and we presuppose it's a closed set. It'll be the point on the crater with them that's closest to 45 degree line, which is the top. Is that I mean the axis picture? Hmm? Okay. So, a, a compromise. Well, that doesn't. I, I don't think it's good to call it to say that. It is what it is, namely, it's the closest point to the quality um, <coughs> in the front here. So, it has that feature. So, it's making, if you, if you like, a mouse for both of these ideas in its own way. Yeah. Is it, is it equal to the max? The same point as the max? Yes. The same point. The same point. Yeah. Of course, I'm making, uh, uh, I presume it's always a concave downwards and so forth and so on. Well, um, maybe let's uh, think about this as sometime I'd be happy to remain uh, afterwards and I you know, would have questions. This, I realize this is extremely abstract. Um, so maybe I'll proceed if it's uh, all right. Okay. I wanted to say some things about the legitimate expectations, entitlement, and desert, which are likely to cause uh, trouble. Um, things said about them are not often in the text as clear as, as, as they should be. Now, we are assuming that distribution always takes place in accordance with legitimate expectations and earned entitlements within this scheme of adjusted procedural justice. And these expectations are specified by the public system of rules, always, of the scheme of social cooperation that exists. Suppose, for example, that these rules include uh, provisions that make allowance up to wage agreements and salary agreements. Suppose they include plans for profit sharing on certain kinds of, of conditions and so on. All those things are all parts of the scheme of the cooperation and other public rules. Then those who enter into and honor these agreements and cooperate accordingly on the basis of these expectations and of these rules, then have a legitimate expectation of receiving the agreed amount at the agreed time. That is, an expectation simply, as opposed to a legitimate expectation, is simply something like one expects the sun to rise and a whole lot of other things which would be based on, on evidence inductive grounds and so forth and so on, on science or whatever, common sense. Here we're talking about a legitimate expectation, which is based on what the institutional public rules are, and which if we act in the light of them and do our part, entitle us to receive persons. In the text it said that uh, Legitimate expectations of the other side of the principle of fairness. And that principle is discussed in, in contrast with natural duty uh, in, the, in the text. So that the idea is that what people are entitled to 
depends on what these rules and agreements say they are entitled to, and what the individuals uh, do uh, depends again on what they say they're entitled to. And so there's this reciprocal uh, interaction between the expect legitimate expectations and people are entitled to as defined by the rules. It's said on page 84 and 88 where this idea is asserted. Now, observe that there's no criterion of a legitimate expectation that's apart from what these public rules said. Always, of course, is being assume that the rule satisfies the principles of justice and their reasonably effective and efficient in that sense. But they are rules that develop within this framework and they satisfy or that they are within a framework of a basic structure that satisfies these overall uh, principles. So, so that all claims that arise um, and will then be counted as, as legitimate or what people are entitled to on the basis of these rules. So the precepts that adjust and, and explain what these entitlements are are generated from within the system of cooperation itself. <coughs> now, this statement, the one I just made, is, uh, I think, easy to misunderstand. That is, we often believe that we have a concept of moral desert, which is prior to and independent of existing social practices. And it's easy then to think that T.J. rejects that concept uh, by saying there is no such concept as that of moral desert as defined by a whole variety of comprehensive moral, moral doctrines. So I want to examine this. I believe that in the text that it recognizes at least three ideas of desert that we might in ordinary lives count or confuse with, let's say, fall under the notion of moral desert. The perverse of these ideas is the ideas of moral desert as the moral worth of character or moral virtue. What morally good character is, as defined by some comprehensive moral uh, doctrine. So that would be one idea. Another idea is the idea of the legitimate expectations and its companion idea of entitlements, which we had just talked about. And I mentioned it's the other side of the principle of fairness, and that is discussed in section 48. I was all the way back in chapter 5. And the third idea is the idea of deservingness as specified by a scheme of public rules which is designed to achieve certain purposes, ordinary, past safe, and for our purposes, social purposes. So I'll comment on each of these in turn. Now, the text, Justices to Fairness, uh, does not question at all, not even has to reject the concept of moral desert, nor does it deny that this concept, as defined within very comprehensive views, applies to person's character. What it holds is that no concept, a moral desert, is a suitable basis for a conception of political justice for democratic society, an altogether different man. That is to say, we're working within a political conception, and by that I mean it applies to political institutions, and not within some comprehensive uh, moral doctrine. We're saying that 
no particular concept of moral desert, where I mean by a particular concept as defined by some particular moral doctrine, say a Kant's view, or Mill's view, or an intuitionist view, or Aristotle, or, or whatever, none of those will be suitable as a political conception of justice within a democratic society. Why? Because we have these profound differences of view on our conceptions of the good that we cannot agree about them. And we should not attempt to base or to use in any important way in our political conception a notion about which there is fundamental and very deep disagreement. Not that those ideas are said to be all false, but that we should not come to a political understanding about them. Also, I think, it's another matter of practicality, that it's impracticable to try to judge people's moral norm <coughs> or the character in any serious way when it comes to political in institutions. So we might, and often that we do think that, that, that those kind of judgments of moral or the character is the kind that only God can make. Uh, or that we would make in our personal life, but we can't do it for political purposes. So it's not being rejected, that notion. It's saying for various grounds you don't want to use it within a political construction. Turning to the second, the idea of general expectations already have largely considered. All I um, am going to add is that Keep in mind again that a whole within a political conception is not supposed to apply within the family, within personal relationships, or within various associations and, and institutions of, of within society. In general, those forms of relationship will have their own suitable principles and criteria, and it will be another question, in each case, how far is something like the notion of fairness or given expectations in life applies to them. We just, uh, this is not a general doctrine, so we have to ask how far the notions that we develop here hold in these other cases. Okay, come to the third idea of deservingness, which is very slightly indicated, and we ought to say more about it, but sorry, I'll mention it here. It's indicated on page 314, namely, of the idea of deservingness as specified by the public scheme rules designed to achieve certain social, social purposes. Now, on 314, it's indicated by a familiar example of a game, as when we say, the team that lost deserved to win. It's a common expression, and we know what that means. Uh, we don't mean that they don't win. We don't mean that they don't have the title. We don't mean that they don't get the honor to go with that and all the rest. What we mean is that the game is designed to develop and to encourage certain skills and perhaps even certain virtues of a certain kind, maybe to be brave or courageous if you're a downhill skier or whatever. And certain people or teams manifest those in a particular play of the game more than those who won. But all games are subject to chance and to hazard and who knows what. And it may be that that kind of a contingency, the team that deserves to win loss. But the game itself is designed, the kinds of qualities and virtues it calls forth give us an idea of what's a deserving team, even though it may not actually succeed. And analogously to something like uh, social cooperation, regulated by the difference principle, again, is designed to 
cover the cost of educating, disciplining our, our talents, exercising certain positions of responsibility, and a, a variety of things that we've indicated. So in to this sense, we might say that if the scheme is well run, and there isn't a lot of, of fortuitous chance operating in it, then most of the time, or a lot of the time, um, the, the, those who, who are better off, perhaps, deserve to be so, in this sense of deservingness. But that's not moral desert. And it, it doesn't mean they have good character in any in, interesting, deep religious sense or moral sense. Um, I think most of us probably realize that, that often perhaps, and that there are aspects of their character that's really rather bad character. Um, I'm not necessarily sure, for example, that the character of a, of a good president, uh, as opposed to a great one, uh, doesn't have a lot of attributes that aren't very attractive from certain points of view but they might deserve it because that's the kind of thing you have to do to run a certain kind of regime well. At least, at least that's the thought about it. One should not then uh, confuse the notion of deservingness that goes with the scheme of the general expectations as a notion of a moral desert that would go within some comprehensive moral view. Well, so in, in TJ then, both the second and the third notions appear and are used. The first notion is not denied, I think, to exist, but that it's unworkable uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Now I come to two final points. Um, I hope you all don't find this a too shocking song. Anyway, uh, uh, I'll proceed anyway. Um, it's what I think is required if you follow through the idea of a political conception. You really see um, everything that's required by that, implied by that under certain kinds of conditions. Well, in section 17, it said that no one deserved, in the moral sense of desert, that is, in the first sense of desert, that no one deserves their place in the distribution of native endowments. Now, this statement I take to be a truism. I don't think anybody who understood what was being said could deny it. And there's a place in the distribution of native endowments, not realized endowments, native endowments, if you like, a genetic endowment, but that's a fancy modern term. Not the place in the distribution of native endowments is not deserved. It's a truism, and I think it's clear that neither the second nor the third notions of desert even apply to that case. So it doesn't even arise. So the only thing that that would hold, unless you had another notion of desert from the three that I've indicated, uh, would be moral desert. So it takes that to be a truism, and not anything that someone would find to not. In section 17 also, this is page 101, it is also said that the difference principle represents an agreement to regard, and I emphasize the term regard, the distribution of native endowments, the distribution of endowments, now, as a common asset, and to share the benefits of this distribution, whatever it turns out to be. Now note carefully what this statement others might get said. What it is saying is what it means if we agree to the difference principle. The idea is the following. If we agree to the difference principle, 
in the original position, and if that accords with our view in the flight of equilibrium and so forth, we are in effect agreeing to regard, to regard the distribution as a common asset. It is not said that this distribution prior to agreement is a common asset. The question is how, if we accept the different principle, we are regarding it. And it's said that we're regarding it as a common asset. And what it means to regard it as a common asset is actually given by the principle itself. In other words, there isn't, as it were, some independent idea of what it means to regard, I think, as a common asset other than what that principle says. That, uh, in other words, uh, what's involved in not going beyond the maximum point is the kind of principle of reciprocity. You stop here because you come to a point where greater gains to the more advantage begin hurting the less advantage. That's why you stop. Because at this point, reciprocity stops. And that's what it means to regard the distribution as a common asset. Now, the important point here, then, is that none of this is an argument for the difference. Any argument is going to have to be given within the framework of TJ from the original position, other than, of course, um, whether or not we can accept all this from the collective equilibrium and all of that. But any argument, and any, I say, we're presenting a formal argument, or, well, it isn't formal, but you know what I mean. Um, laying it out as to what we would agree to, that's always done from the original position. And we aren't doing that here. We're just explaining in all chapter two on the whole what this principle involves and <coughs> what's it mean. And I think it's a fall of the text that it, it isn't as clear about that as it should be. The point is an another thing. This is the, an, another point is that until principles of political justice are accepted, native endowments and their natural distribution is neither a common asset nor a private asset, because the notions of property and ownership are not yet defined. All these things are is parts biological parts, physiological parts, functional parts of human beings. That's all. We don't yet have the notions of property or common asset on which an argument could be based. So it doesn't go from, well, we see that the distribution is a common asset and therefore we arrive at the different principle. That argument would be unintelligible. Uh, in terms of how the view is set up. Well, I'm going over the time. I just want to make one last point, and that is that these uh, native endowments are our own in the sense that uh, they are protected and can't be removed, if you like, out of our heads or out of our bodies by the notion of the integrity of the person, which would be guaranteed the first principle. But I'll stop here. Um, and remind you that uh, there, uh, there is a handout on the right for today, and a handout for Bob uh, on, the, on the corner.